And I'm doing a book right now on MOOCs and open education around the world and a special issue of a journal. That book on MOOCs and open education around the world will be published by Rutledge early next spring. And we have 30 chapters, including the Open U in the UK and the University of Edinburgh here in the, in, in, in the, in the UK. We have chapters from the Open U of Korea and the Open U of Japan. Uh, we have a couple Australia chapters, South Africa. Cape Town has a, Cape Town is a big player in this open education movement. They actually have a, a number of initiatives for open scholarship. And they were the place where the Declaration of Open Education was signed by Jimmy Wales from Wikipedia and others uh, about seven, eight years ago. Uh, we have chapters from Ireland. Ireland's a big hotbed right now for e-learning. There's a new company called Allison, which is enabling people in the corporate world to get free courses paid by advertising within the courses, and that's there. We have, of course, a couple chapters from Canada where a lot of the openness of education really started. The first massive open online class started in 2008 uh, by my friends George Siemens and Stephen Downs up in Canada. They had 18 paying students and 2,000 free riders. Uh, and their fingers went numb just giving feedback to everybody. They were very conscientious trying to prove a new theory of psychology called connectivism. How to get people to connect to one another and, and where our, our, our intelligence is in our networks, in effect, in LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and so forth and, and, the, and the resources we connect to. Malcolm Gladwell, the author, talks about uh, being a maven and being a connector. If you've read his books, um, Tipping Point and Blink and uh, Outliers, he talks about this notion of why Facebook and LinkedIn can really um, serve as a, a tool for community building and, and knowledge management, if you will. So there's a lot of, so in the book we have chapters, I mean we're just collecting them now, the Virtual African University will have a chapter. Um, what we're missing is South, South America is not doing a whole lot in the space of, of um, um, open education and massive open online learning. Uh, but we do have Africa covered and Australia and, and East Asia in particular, India. Um, there's a lot of interesting things today happening in India in terms of reuse of content, repurposing of content for mobile devices. There's a million people, at one point a million people a month in India getting mobile access. There are now more mobile subscriptions than people have TVs, more mobile subscriptions than have the electricity. Some say more mobile than have toilets. More people have mobile phones than have toilets. Uh, so mobile's expanding. And yesterday at Cambridge, I talked quite a bit about 15 ways that learning's changing. Learning's become more comfortable, as I mentioned earlier. It's more uh, video-based, I mentioned earlier. We're moving to <coughs> videopedia kind of thing. It's become more collaborative. You see you using an iPad and sharing what you have on an iPad. It never would happen on a desktop. We never really shared much. Uh, so learning's become more collaborative in nature, even the way we set up the tables today for a little more collaboration and sharing. Uh, learning is more open, and we've covered that. Learning is more online and blended. So there's many ways in which learning is changing uh, where uh, we wouldn't have, who would have predicted that MIT would put 2,000 classes on the web for free? Uh, as, you know, 9-11 was a tipping point for many people politically, but 4-11 <coughs> was a major day. On April 4th, 2001, Six months before 9-11, five months before 9-11, Charles Vest, the president at MIT, let's, said, let's make education free to the world. And uh, he said, let's let other universities join us in this effort. So I've been researching people using OpenCourseWare, people involved in MOOCs, and what are the motivational aspects of using MOOCs and, what, and using OpenCourseWare? What gets people excited? And we're looking at life change. How are people getting new jobs? How are people going back to school and getting, you know, primed for um, algebra and geometry so they can get back into school, how people are retiring and starting new businesses. There's all sorts of fascinating life stories happening here in this giant world of open education that uh, you know, we not, might not have ever predicted, but it's happening. It's a really fascinating world that's, that's going on today. Uh, and so yesterday in my talk, uh, I have a series of life story changes I went through. Uh, and you can download that, that talk. And if you want to read the papers I have in, in review on this notion of, of life change, uh, send me a note and um, I will, I'll, I'll send you what we have been working on. So we, we had um, a couple thousand people who are using MIT Open Contents send us back an email, of, uh, a survey we, we had on uh, how they're using it and why they're using it. And I guess why I'm pointing out the 10 principles of motivation are embedded in their responses. I mean, you wouldn't believe how, 
how closely they align with what they had to say about how they learn and why they're using the, the content. So they seem to be holding water, um, uh, but it's an eclectic model. You know, it's a, it's a, and I think education serves best here in the 21st century with eclectic models of psychology. Learning environments are what we create, the best learning environment. And we, in the past, psychologists debated, is behavioral approach extrinsic money recognition best, or is it intrinsic? Is cognitive theory more telling, metacognition the, the, the thing we need to emphasize, or is it something else? Is it social learning? Do we learn from watching others? Um, like, does violence beget violence on watching violence TV? Today, it's, I think we're looking at all theories linking together in psychology in some way, shape, or form, because nobody really needs to understand any one perspective fully. You just need to understand some basic principles that are norms across them, like making learning relevant, having goals. We're, we're goal-driven creatures, if you will, humans are. Having commitments to something, a passion. You know, dissertations are really built around passion, nothing else, you know, really. Teaching is only two things. You challenge and support. That's really all we do. We challenge people, push them to the edges till we get criers, and then we support them to get them through the crying phase. Uh, and schools really just, um, you know, provide resources and respect for students um, out there. And so you know, this teaching is kind of simple, but it's very, very complex. We're moving from an age in which we were credit managers to an age where we're concierges, to an age in which we're curators of content, uh, we're cultivators of, of, of knowledge. The C words today have changed from credit managers and camp commanders and things like that. I, I look at myself as a concierge, and I've always looked at myself as a camping trip guide. Uh, I have. Uh, no, that doesn't work in all disciplines. There's some disciplines where you have to be pretty predefined and constrained in what you let people do because you have some set knowledge you want them to acquire, but you can still provide a sense of exploration within that framework or a sense of, of choice within that framework. It might be less choice than what uh, are embedded in my, my courses, but I think, I think um, curators is a key word. There is so much content. We, our uh, faculty and staff and instructional designers become curators of the best stuff. So as I mentioned this morning, one hour in the closet, two hours better. Um, you can, and, and, and I think every discipline should find 10 or 20 items of high quality from the Smithsonian's or from the British Library or from King's College or from Yale, Open Yale. Um, if we all found 10 or 20 high quality contents to start with, you see, uh, there'd be less of this controversy about all the junk online. We just need to find those 10 or 20 high quality contents just to, to go from that and then build on that. So TED Talks and TED Ed, I think, might be one of those places to start tapping into today. The U U United Nations World Digital Library, if you're in history or so so uh, social, uh, social study areas. Um, so I'm rambling here a little bit, but I, I, I didn't want to go right back in and go through the next five. I kind of want to give you a kind of a bigger picture of, of all this. Yeah, these things are, what I'm talking about here can help your teaching, but really it's the bigger picture of what's happening in the learning world uh, today that, that's in, in a way more important because today kids are coming with their mobiles. They don't have the keyboards like us dumb people do like I have. Now this keyboard lasted me one day. It was a transitionary phone. I didn't have a smartphone till a year ago and they said, well, I might need a keyboard and I got, it didn't, didn't need it actually after a day. Uh, but, um, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm using, I'm not using all the things, I'm using most of the things I'm talking about, I actually have used, but not everyone. You know, some I'm still looking at and deciding to, to embed. Oh, and in the book, the, the, the free book, uh, the web resources section is probably the one chapter that you want to download of all those, because all the links then will be there. All of them are hot links, and, um, or the reference section. Uh, so if I was looking at the book, that would be the chapter I'd open up, or it's not even a chapter, but I'd open up the web resources section because it does have things organized by here are collaborative tools, here are podcast tools, here are wiki tools and so forth. Here are timeline tools, visualization tools. Um, we've got them indexed that way by chapter. So uh, that took a while and to keep them, ha -ha, uh, you know, keep them up to date as we wrote the book for three years, white some of those bulbs. went you know, dead. Um, so Maybe light bulbs, people have a few light bulbs so far going off, some things they can actually take from today. So it's, you know, so really we're coasting now the rest of the way. There's nothing you're gonna get. You got enough stuff, you don't need any more. Close your ears, put the earplugs in, you know. Uh, there's nothing more to be learned, you know. Well, actually, there's a lot more relevant stuff. Who said they're an accountant? Someone said they're trained as an accountant. Or, oh, the lady who left. Of course, the accountant left. Um, no, she's working on her doctorate in accounting. 
My friend here at uh, Franklin College teaches accounting. We had forensic people. Where's our forensic people? This is forensic accounting. We lost our forensic people, didn't we? To meetings, I think. So this guy teaches cost behavior. So you go through this little animation, this little sequence, and he'll walk you through fixed and variable costs. He's trying to show a real company what they're, you know, today data from Amazon. Today data from Amazon, Google, Best Buy is all available to us just like that. Last year's financials. If you want to get students immersed hey, in... Hi, Corey Grant. Thanks for coming in. Can I call you, Dan? That works for me. I'm Corey Grant. Uh, everyone calls me Corey. You're probably wondering why I asked you to come in today. Yeah, the thought crossed my mind. Well, I'm an independent financial investigator and auditor. Your president, Ms. Uh, Patricia Samuels, asked me to look into some payroll issues associated with your company. So why do you want to talk to me? Payroll accounting handles all of those issues. So it's a that's a forensic accounting class where you're going into investigating this guy, okay? Case learning, scenario learning's alive and well online today. I did case learning in 97, 98, 99, 2000. We had a project with Warwick University, uh, Yavaska University in Finland, the University of Oulu, and then Kung Hee in Korea. We had student teachers, practicing teachers, write cases of problems in schools in Korea, in Peru, UK, US. We had to solve each other's problems. They had to tie in concepts from the book to what they saw in the field. But they didn't want to look dumb to their foreign peers, so they were going to depth, much more depth than normal. They were like, we have to read the book? I mean, students in other places are reading this book? My students weren't reading. You know, American students don't read the book, by the way. They go off and party half the time. Uh, undergraduates I'm talking about, not grad students, but freshmen and sophomores. We have a huge problem. So one way in which we elevated the critical thinking, the depth of the discussion, was by having students write the cases instead of us writing the cases. So doing uh, Harvard Business, in fact, Harvard doesn't do Harvard Business cases anymore. There's so many real world cases out there and real world experiences. Some places are using case writers. They embed a person from class in a business writing cases, talking to the CFO and EIEO and COO, and they write real world cases instead of using prepackaged ones. You know. As I said, I did ethics cases for, that were Harvard business-like cases for Arthur Anderson. You know, these were the, t the key ways of learning t two decades ago. And today, we've got real world cases, or in this case, it's a, this is professor making this one up. But relevance and meaningfulness, preparing video scenario accounting interviews, and preparing a course for course uh, review. My friend, Mark Braun, teaches uh, pathology. He's a medical blood doctor in, uh, in Indiana, in Bloomington. He writes a cases. Um, exams, medical exam for first year medical students. Instead of having his students write them, he has a case of a man with a cough, a woman with a chest pain. Um, uh, I can't read these here real clearly, but you get a, a woman with uh, influenza and so forth. All these are different case problems. He has slides, blood slides, he has uh, medical exams with protein counts and uh, blood pressure readings and all sorts of things. Each case takes him seven hours to put together. And he has 40, 50 odd cases up online. And uh, he has tests wrapped around these, quizzes wrapped around these for his first year medical students. And these are free online, actually. If, yeah, I believe he'll let other people access these. I don't think you have to be in the IU system. So if someone's interested here in uh, tapping into this, you might actually just be able to type his name in there, Mark Braun, Indiana University cases. If you can't find them, uh, write to me. So that's number six, gets at relevance and meaningfulness. Now, interactivity, as I said earlier, my students have been using Google Hangouts. We use Skype as well. We use a tool called Jabber at Indiana. Uh, here we have four-part screen. We're having a, a, actually a meeting. This is actually a meeting. This is my students here. This one here, she's from Beijing Normal. Uh, and, and she was popping into my class for free. My other Chinese students told her, uh, that her name's Carrie, and he said, Carrie, you can pop into Dr. Bong's class anytime, he'll let you. So she did, for two semesters, while she was a master's student in China at Beijing Normal. At the end of the semester, she, was, she became so vocal, the students were listening to her, because she had great ideas, actually. And by the end of the semester, she, she was finishing her master's in, in China, and she was looking for a job, and my students found a job for her at UNESCO in Bangkok. That's really fascinating what can happen when you open up your class and so forth. But anyways, um, this guy was at uh, MIT. You remember when the bomb went off last year during the marathon in Boston? 
He was giving us a you know, detailed report of what's going on there, you know, coming in. It wasn't the world's happiest time. She's coming in from Cyprus. She told me I need to use Google Hangouts. He's coming in from Shanghai. We had others around the world. So collaboration is, is alive and well. My 98 book's called Electronic Collaborators. And we got it the early days of, of web-based collaboration. Uh, you heard of Google Documents? How many use Google Documents? Now, how many of you use Pirate Pad? You do. How many use Meeting Words? Meeting Words? You, you've used it or not used it? I used it when I was a student. Yeah, in what class? It was a, a, an e-learning module. With what college? London Metropolitan. Mm. Did it work? Yeah, but it worked because we were all interested in trying it. Ah, so it was a trial thing. Yeah. Yeah. So Meeting Words and Pirate Pad are simpler than Google Documents. And how they do it is they color code people's contributions. So if you're doing an abstract for a conference, you can collaboratively do that in Meeting Words or Pirate Pad. Very simple kind of tool. Very simple way to, uh, to collaborate with others around the world. And it's free. These are like wiki, little wiki tools. How many of you have used wikis? Oh, wiki Spaces? Wiki Spaces? Mm, PB Works? It used to be called Peanut Butter Wiki, PB Wiki, you now PB Works. They're, they, they're still, um, P, Wiki Spaces is free for educators. Uh, PB Works, I think, is free, isn't it, for education? Or has they got a paid version now? They got yeah, paid for it now? Back when I used it, it was free. Um, we have students doing discussions, brainstorming meetings, drafts of chapters, glossaries. Glossaries are kind of fun to put as a class in a wiki. Everyone does a different letter, maybe, and adds to the glossary. So interactive, collaborative, engagement, effort. Having this student did a timeline using Dippity of an author, uh, a book that uh, she was assigning her class. She was a teacher. She did an interactive timeline of uh, the same author's books uh, so students could explore them and click along the timeline. And it was quite a fascinating final project that she had created for my class. Don't know if it's even still up there, but maybe, maybe uh, let's see, if, see I'll take a chance. Sometimes you take a chance, you risk it. The whole computer bombs now. Nope, it's not, it's not there. So unfortunately, it's take, she's taken it down. Uh, so some students put it up temporarily during the span of the class. When the class is over, they take them down. This is a fascinating website. If you haven't seen this one, I mean, this is like a top 10 for me in terms of online resources, okay? Of all time, actually. Now, I've got it queued up. This will not take long to queue up, but this is from right here, The Guardian. The Guardian did this really cool thing on Arab Spring. And let's see if I can uh, find Arab Spring. Maybe I've lost it. Uh, do we go beyond? Yeah, must have, I must have clicked out, so let me go back in and try and open it up. They've indexed, you see it doesn't take long to open up, actually. They've indexed all countries in, in the Middle East from Algeria to Yemen. And what they've got along, one, that's along the horizontal, along the vertical axis, they've got dates and time. January 9th, January 23rd, uh, February 20th. And on the axis here, you can see what's happening in Morocco, not a whole lot. But what's happening in Libya then? Well, we can click and find out what's going on in Libya that day and read the article about what's going on that particular. So they basically have indexed the news for all the countries involved in the Arab Spring. And we can find what's going on in Saudi Arabia. And they color-coded different events. Now, if you want to talk about where does the web play a role? I mean, I think interactive timelines like this are pretty fascinating. I think the music for history lovers I showed earlier is kind of a fascinating way to use the web. Uh, maps I had up there earlier, the, the, um, the um, Sandy Hook murders by day. It's an interesting way to use the web or think about the web for visualizing learning. The college degrees over time and a timeline. There's stuff on the Civil War, someone asked me earlier. There's um, news about the Civil War by day, by month, and you can see how the news changes by, to different states in the U.S. Uh, based on where the armies were moving and so forth. Really fascinating kinds of stuff are, you can find online. Uh, number eight, engagement. Now this is a new thing I've been starting and it's working really, really well. Uh, if you're interested in Facebook and Twitter and how to use it in teaching, this is the guy to read about. So if you're using uh, social media, 
This guy, Ray Junko, is, um, was at Harvard in the, as a visiting scholar. He's now at Purdue University. We call it Purdue. It's in Indiana. No one go, from Indiana, we don't go there. But he's actually in the libraries. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening in the libraries, and Purdue hired him as a researcher. He's been researching Twitter and Facebook, and we brought him into my, into my class. He said, Dr. Kurt, I don't, I don't have time to prepare a talk. I told him, it's okay. Don't worry about preparing a talk. What we'll do, we're going to capture slides from your articles. We're going to capture them. We're going to have students put quotes up from your articles in the chat box, in the chat window. And all you have to do is respond to those ones you want to respond to. So we're clicking through his research, his own articles, his own data, his own quotes, his own words. He didn't put together anything. We put the talk together for him. And whatever he didn't want to talk about, whatever he couldn't remember his own research, he said, pass. Let's go to the next thing. Or he said, it's not, that's not important. My research has moved beyond that. This is one of the most engaging. We talk about engagement. He got my students engaged because they had to research him. They had to read about him. They had to find stuff. They had to put it together. It got him engaged because he didn't know what was coming. It was coming up like this. It got me engaged because I, I didn't know how this class was going to go. I was a little worried that, you know, he's, he, it was, I've done this a few times since then. It saves everybody a lot of, uh, a lot of time, actually. I can call him up. You know, a couple of days before the event, have my students go online, find the stuff, put it together. So guest speaker quotes, guest speaker video. Either way, you can just put quotes up or you can do like this. We did both, quotes and pictures. I think this is a, you know, has anyone done this? This is something that dawned on me. It's one of the hundred activities in the book. Um, last year, we had a cage match. My friend Chuck Severance at Michigan teaches massive open online courses on the history of the internet. He's now doing a massive course on programming for everybody. Programming, teaching high school teachers and college teachers how to program. It just this uh, June started. We had a debate at a conference. He's from Michigan where it's blue's the color. I'm from Indiana with red. We had the audience pick the topics to discuss. Ten topics, um, controversial ones. We yelled out number one, number two, number three, number four, and the audience said number four. So we debated number four. Number five, we debate number five. The audience then held up blue cards and red cards for whoever won the round and we got to beat the other one up. Now, I'm not suggesting you do this with your students. What I'm suggesting is that you can have debates online, controversy online, have students pick the controversies to discuss and have pro and con debates, pro and con discussions and so forth. I have two students take the pro side, two students take the con side, they debate and they switch roles and they come to compromise, okay? Um, I have debates from roles that they take on. Like I said earlier, my students take a psychology class with me and they become famous psychologists where they debate from their perspective, okay? Challenge games. Right now in the U.S. for secondary students, challenge games in math, challenge games in vocabulary are hot, are, um, are very popular, where students will compete with other schools for what they know about math, what they know about spelling, vocabulary. They're getting awards for this stuff. So we actually have vocabulary competitions and every Sunday morning I get 10 words sent to me that I'm, I'm actually learning in this website, vocabulary.com, new English words. So my vocabulary is not that good, okay? And um, I scored really low on vocabulary. And so I'm trying to learn uh, new words, and this is a free website. It sends me a set, and it sends me, if I get them right, it sends me a few of those back. Uh, challenges me, you know, to get more, to get uh, harder ones as we go along. Uh, projects, product-based learning. My students design videos of what they've learned in my class. So my student here, Pio Carlo from Italy, what you're about to see is a shop. he did a video of what he learned in my class on new technology and he compared it to his family life. So he had different aspects of his own life <coughs> in the video. A video about the intersection between modern life and emerging technologies, showing us how we learn every day without realizing it. So, in so he goes through into his own family life and what he's using technology with. So these are different, actually this is a different part of the course that he learned.
bringing together authors and experts and learners to collaborate on writing the content. So that's him using technology. He explains how he uses and what he's using. Another student created a framework of what he learned in my class. He's from Mexico. Hello there. My name is Miguel, and in this video, I will show you why Web 2.0 technologies have the potential to promote learning by providing higher levels of freedom. So he'll walk through his freedom framework, mnemonic. Each letter of this freedom stood for something he learned in my class. And so he walks through how boring online learning was a decade ago and how today it's more exciting for him to learn. Then anytime and anywhere, especially by using mobile devices from which students can read papers, listen to podcasts, or even watch videos from classes they missed. So that's the first letter. One of the main reasons why students drop online classes is the feeling of isolation with Web 2.0. So his second letter was student rapport. So he had different letters he walked you through and he linked to the class. A third student, she went to the Gagnum, you've seen the Gagnum video in Korea. She linked her learning to this particular video. She's one of my Chinese students. Okay, I'm going to skip out of there. Just as a little projects that she did. Another one of my classes, we did wiki books. My students wrote books using a wiki tool. And this book that they wrote on the web 2.0, a book that we wrote on new technologies, is now still up. And my current students can add to the book. I have a book on learning theories. My current students can add to the book. Students in China, students in Malaysia, students in Taiwan all worked with my class in the USA to write a book. So yielding a product. So we got a product of videos, we got a product of a book. We got another, another website that's interesting is um, something called Milestone Planner. In Milestone Planner and 43 Things, and I done this, you list your goals. What are your goals? And you get social support for meeting your goals. So it's a way to set goals up. And uh, so start listing what your goals are, and then you'll create a support network to help you reach those goals. Uh, today, we see a lot of people designing video, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, multimedia assignments are popular, as I had up there earlier, video assignments. So that's the end of this part three, in effect. So two cheers for the web, the New York Times said. Three, two cheers for the web. Uh, maybe. Of these five, meaningfulness, engagement, interactivity, tension, yielding products, which of these do you think might be most beneficial for you? Which do you, if you had to pick one of these five, if you had to pick one of these five, would it be goals? Who would pick goals or products? Number 10. Who would pick number nine? Challenge. Tension. Who would pick number, what is that? This would be number eight, interactive, collaborative. Who would pick number six, effort and engagement? Who would pick, uh, I guess that's seven. Who would pick number six, relevance and meaningfulness? Okay. So that's the tech variety model, tone, encouragement, curiosity, variety, autonomy, relevance, and so forth, tech variety. For those coming late, the entire book is free. If you go to techvariety.com, T-E-C-Variety.com. Make it so. So make it so. I love it when they say make it so, okay. Are we moving to holodeck-like experiences? There's a company in Canada trying to create such a, a thing. They say, we've got, we've got um, uh, audio, we've got video. What we lack is tactile kinds of things. But they're trying to build Program complete. Enter when ready. a holodeck experience. But we'll see. Um, I was going to have some web exploration activity here, but I think I'm going to try something else uh, at this point. Uh, we have some new people in the room. Three new people just walked into the room. Uh, this is what I think we should do. I think we're going to do this. Uh, what's your name? Sam. Sam. Okay. So, um, and, and your name? Haida. Haida. And? Haida. Haida. Okay. So, um, trying to find the right. Yeah, this will work. So, why don't you, on your note card that you have in front of you, of that last section, 
What are some ideas, let me go back through the list, I'll go back through here, that you can use. We just went through in here goals, video summaries, competitions, speaker quotes, Arab Spring on a timeline, timelines, meeting words, pirate pad, Google Hangouts, case learning, so forth. Is there something in there that you can use? There's handouts here about flipped classrooms, there's videos about flipped classrooms so you can understand what it is. But I also want to have a little bit of time for Q&A and, and so forth. So this is going to be a very, very pithy overview about video. Um, and I think that's probably good. I think your brains have gotten enough stuff anyways. You know, and this is normally happens in part four anytime I do a workshop. But we're about here in part four. So don't feel like there's any different than any other day that I'm, I do a fart part thing. Because usually we don't even get to part four oftentimes. So we, we're going to at least touch on it here a little bit. It's near and dear to my heart, uh, this part. Because some people today are using video in many ways to um, you know, enhance their marketing of their classes. You know, we see these celebrity professors and so forth. And why is this important? From a, from a scholarship standpoint, from a psychological standpoint, we know that students learn more when they have a video, com a common experience. People at Vanderbilt talked about anchoring learning 20, 30 years ago. Anchored instruction is important. Learning and subsuming new ideas under old ideas. Advanced organizers, having something come before the learning. A flipped classroom is advanced organizer for something that's going to happen later. David Ozabel from Illinois talked about this for a long time. Trans Bransford here, formerly of Vanderbilt, now at Washington. Richard Mayer at Cal State, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. And Ellen Pavio in Canada talking about dual coding theory. Storing things visually and verbally is important. Uh, if you have two ways to get at it, it's no longer tip of the tongue knowledge, it's now available and accessible, not just available. You can pull it out and use it if you have two tracks to learn from. Anchored instruction from John Bransford said that if we have a context, a macro context, we can show Raiders of the Lost Ark and, and say, how many Indiana Jones is the pit wide? Well, everyone's seen the little flick, so now you can do some physics and math around this video. You all watch, it's a common experience. You can say, could he replace the golden statue with a bag of sand? You see, these are we have the anchor. We can replay the video and show it again and, you know, look for subtle cues in that video. Multimedia theory from Richard Mayer tells us that two things are better than three. If you give people three things, it's too much. And you have to get the text close to the video. You can't have them too far apart, too separate, or you won't make the linkage or the connection. He has many principles about narration, audio, and so forth. So very, very important. So I use videos to anchor instruction. We show B.F. Skinner, shaping of pigeons to be in World War II, you know, and attack Nazi ships, whatever. <laughs> not, not pigeons, but anyhow, dolphins and so forth. I show a little video and my, then we read about Skinner's work. I actually met, I worked with B.F. Skinner's daughter and husband and got to meet him before he died. Um, and I can tell stories about that as an advanced organizer and so forth. Short little video clips. The guy with the incredible brain learned Icelandic language in a week, created his own Scandinavian language. He had epilepsy and, and um, Autism as a young kid, and it rewired his brain. He memorized pi out to 20,000 digits. You know this guy from here and right nearby, here in, in, in the London area? I show this and we talk about working memory. We start with a video. So I show a video from Current TV, CNN, Link TV, TED Talks, TED Ed. There's a guy in Nottingham who has a periodic table of visual elements. You know, he talks about sodium and iron, iron and he has, chem he has uh, uh, experiments and these are all free online to teach chemistry around the world, you know. Um, book TV, interviews of authors. This guy's a famous University of Washington professor uh, who has a book on the brain. It's called The Brain Rules. He has a video for each chapter explaining schema theory, short-term memory, working memory, and he's funnier than heck. I, I, this guy's one of the best speakers you can get. High energy, unlike, unlike Bonk, you know. Um, <laughs> You know, high energy, very interesting, but he's interviewed in Book TV. Book TV, you can find interviews of authors of books your students are reading. Why not use them? There's all sorts of websites, Wonder How To and Howcast, again, how to fix a wet cell phone, don't know how it fell in the toilet. Um, I have my 27 videos you can use. I mentioned earlier, there are dialogues around video called Vialogues. You can discuss the video. You can have test questions around the video. These things are exploding today. 
and then there, oh, on mine, you can chop up the video with tube chop. If you don't want to watch a whole 45 minute video, put it in tube chop, give the starting point and ending point, and then you have a URL that you get for that one minute clip to show it, demonstrate something. Um, you can annotate video. One of my students did a dissertation where the students annotated video of expert teachers for uh, what they were doing. And he looked at the benefits of annotation. And there's a new tool that just came out uh, last month, a video animation to teach film analysis. Brand new tool that was in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. So those are some things about video very quickly. Um, in terms of flipped classrooms, the, the um, the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education and The Guardian are talking a lot about flipped classrooms lately. Educause in the U.S. has a seven things you should know about flipped classrooms. One of my friends in Pennsylvania has a class right now, well, it's ending next week, on flipped classrooms that you could have signed up for a month ago. Uh, now I'm going to go back in time. That was the end of the talk. Now I'm going to go back. Oh, is this a revolution? Ah, I don't know. So let me go back, and for those who came late, all my notes are posted. You can go to techvariety.com and get all the notes and get my free book. Now, let me go back here a little bit. Let's see what is a flipped classroom. This is an Ohio State professor talking about flipped classrooms. A former student of mine uh, approached me uh, last spring break, and we were talking about what we can do to improve students' performance in the classroom. And we've adopted this flipping the classroom approach where the students watch lecture videos online. They do a pre-lecture assignment and then that opens up the classroom space for us to have better discussions, to dig into the deep underlying concepts of the chemistry content and to also get them to work on problems rather than just copy down notes. Ten years ago, I wouldn't be able to do this because I would have had to write the lecture on the chalkboard. The students would have to copy it down. But now with the technology that we have, it really opens up the, the classroom for us. I think it's a, a very um, exciting time in education because uh, at a school like Ohio State, we have plenty of resources available to play around and really enhance our learning for our students. And, and that's really the bottom line, to better deliver the content and to get our students to understand some content. Okay. Penn State has a video, Pennsylvania State, explaining flip classroom. The links will be all there for you. I'm just going to show a, a second of this one, just a minute of this one. They work on homework and group assignments during their own time. What if there were a way to do the lectures outside of class time so you could use class time to have students work on activities together? Welcome to Flipping the Classroom Center Speech. It's a pretty common course design. Students gather in a classroom a few times a week to hear a lecture. A faculty member may show slides, play a few videos, demonstrate some concepts, or solve problems. On their own time, students work on problems and arrange times to meet to work on group projects. Some faculty are finding ways to increase student engagement and improve learning by flipping this design. In the new model, students watch, listen to, and interact with content on their own time, and then use class time for engaging activities. Here's how it works. Say you're teaching a biology course. One week, you talk about invasive animal species, such as the Asian carp. Instead of lecturing, you post a few YouTube videos about Asian carp. You also produce a video of your own in which you show some photographs of other invasive species and talk about their origins. You want to keep each video interesting, so you keep them under 10 minutes each. To help trigger discussion, you also include some questions that you will be asking students to think and talk about during your next class session. Later in the session, so basically, this notion of flipping the classroom was started by this guy here, Salman Khan of the Khan Academy. He created videos on math and algebra for his nieces and nephews that went viral. Bill Gates saw him, his kids were watching him, he said, I'll give you 10 million bucks to enhance these and create the videos for the world in math, algebra, geometry, English, and so forth. Well, this, this trend has started snowballing, not just for secondary, but for college today. And there are a number of principles uh, related to flipping the classroom. This is a, I'm, I won't show all of this, I'll just show a brief bit of this one too. Well, now, sorry about that. No, women can say I've got this queued up, it. sorry. I've got it queued up somewhere else. Finally, tonight, a new way for school kids to do their homework and perhaps a ray of hope for the parents who frequently get called upon to help. Dean Reynolds takes us inside the flipped classroom. The way it has to travel a lot farther. At Warren Township High School in Gurney, Illinois, science teacher Colin Black helps kids do homework in class and sends his lectures 
home. So the way the up, part down, of us like that. Black and others who've embraced what's called the flipped classroom condensed their lectures into a brief, homemade, and often lighthearted video. Visible light is actually the smallest, teeniest, tiniest part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Students can digest the information outside of class whenever they like. The next day, they get their questions answered and apply the lesson with the teacher in the room. I can talk faster in the video because I don't have to slow down for the kids to, to make sure they're catching it. And because they can pause. Right, they can pause it, they can rewind it. So I can talk faster and they can pick up the information quicker. Freshman Haley Dorsey echoed that point. So I'll pause that there. So there's a number of principles around flipping the classroom. Basic notion of flipping the classroom is you rearrange how time is spent. You have time outside the classroom to learn the lectures, and then you come to class for problem solving, decision making, case-based learning, scenario-based learning, and so forth. So in a traditional classroom, you have instructions and notes. In a flipped classroom, you might be able to go deeper during class time into higher order thinking skills, analysis, evaluation, and so forth. Instead of students sleeping and writing notes in a traditional classroom, there's more collaboration, team learning, and so forth. So traditional class, sage on a stage, flip class guide on the side. Um, there are a number of medical examples, some of you from the medical field in here, talking about studio classrooms, a similar kind of concept in a medical field. So we become consultants, we become counselors, we become curators, we become concierges, as I mentioned earlier. Um, some people say the four pillars of flipped are a flexible environment, learning culture changes, more intentional content, and more professional educators. Um, you can read the rest of these notes. There's a lot of things in there. I just give you a quick overview of some of the things about flipped classrooms. But students can rewind, watch, fast forward, reflect, apply. You can do things offline or outside of class that then frees up time in class to do other things. I no longer have to go to work to perform five times a week. Instead, I go to class and interact with my students. And uh, we solve problems. We demonstrate. We do different things. Um, let's see if there's anything else important in here. The test scores are going up in psych intro psychology. Test scores are going up in engineering. Test scores are going up in, uh, in other courses because of the flipped notion. So there actually is some research coming out. Now, students aren't always satisfied with the flipped model. They, some of them want the old model. The instructors, some of them want the old model too. It's hard to change, as we talked earlier. The change is, is difficult. So while the test scores might be going up, dropout rates are going down. That doesn't necessarily mean that, that uh, everything is perfect here because there's a transitionary time. This is going to take some time. I, don't, I think it's going to take a couple decades, to be honest. Then this is not something that's going to happen overnight. I hate to say that, Mark, but we can talk more about that later. Um, and, and so I guess I should stop here at this point and say these notes are online if you want to learn more about flipped classrooms. And, but, but I started with just using video, keep in mind. We're all, how many of you use video in your classes? In the old days, we'd have to order the video. The media department would order the video, pay for the video, then it come in, we have to review the video. Should we keep it or not? Yes, let's keep the video. It goes there and I teach my class. I guess well, I need this video. Somebody else has rented it out. So I've gone through all six months of getting this video ready and someone else has it. Now with the web, you know, you've got all these video contents online. I have a backup plan. If it's not there, I have a second video I can show or a third one. So it's really exciting to just use video to anchor instruction. Flipping goes a little further. And I do this once in a while when I go to a conference. When I come to the UK, I want to flip my class and have students watch the video, my lecture, and we talk about it online I'm in the hotel room. We do different things uh, using Skype or Google Hangout. So I'll, I'll stop at this point. I know you had something you wanted someone to show, but I have three books to give away. Um, do we want to show something, Elena, real quick to people, or? Well, actually, I thought we, I wanted Elena to show that to you, unless you want to. Oh, oh, to me. Okay, after you're going to show me. Okay, so I have three books left to give, uh, to give away. Uh, one of them I want to give away to this person who gives me a great idea of how they're going to use ideas from today. Second one I'm going to give away to someone who has a fantastic question. Third one I'm not so sure about yet. So let's start with the fantastic question. Someone have a... A, a question for me. Yeah. When looking to use technology to enhance the student experience and teaching, I mean, how long do you gauge in regards to looking at software, evaluating it, um, 
Yeah, you know, and, 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 and actually looking at it, so then seeing actually is that value at the end of it, has it really improved? He's actually asking a different question. He's asking, asking me, how do I keep up with all this stuff? Okay, that's, that's the primary bit for actually deciding to use. So how do you keep up and then how do you decide what to do? How do you know if it's working? There's actually three questions he's asking. I think that's a pretty good question. I'll give you a book. <laughs> so, you know, I have a SIN file in a business where we, I, I use a PowerPoint slide deck and every time I see something cool in the, in the news, I cut and paste a screenshot and I put the URL and the date. If I'm coming here to King's College, I'll go back through the file and I have 2014, I already have 2,000 pages of screenshots of things that are cool from articles, research articles, the news, technical reports. I have a file of everything I'm seeing and then I go back through. So when I teach my class, I'm going back through and say, oh, this would be something to use in my class, but it has to have a meaningful and um, purposeful aspect to it. It has to be thoughtful integration. But that being said, Indiana University is a technology demonstration site in education. My building I'm, I'm, I work in is all about technology integration. So my charge is to experiment. We are, we are wasting space at Indiana for not experimenting, but most, most places you shouldn't just do things for the sake of doing it. We have to. I mean, it's our mission. We, we got federal monies, pork they call it, to build our, the building I'm in. You're happy to come visit me. You know, I, I'd give you a tour of our campus, a lovely place, and, and the School of Ed, and we're one of the top public universities in the U.S. for technology integration, actually. We're, we're, we are heading the Internet, too, uh, we, if you know anything about the Internet, too. So, we're well known for, uh, and we've just started a new consortium to try and create an iTunes, basically, for um, higher education. That's another story at the pub. Mark, you have any final comments? And this, what Curtis has presented you today, has not just been the wealth of his thinking, but it is the reality for us now. We cannot put Jack back in the box, folks, so we do need to be thinking about models and frameworks. They are going to exist for a long time. The tools and techniques, as Kurt has said, may well evaporate, but we do need to be thinking in terms of technology enhanced learning and frameworks that are going to stand the test of time and thinking about, as you said, what good education looks like and how it moves into this domain and how this domain moves back into technology. Mm, well said. Oh.